and with a subsequent panel is hear from six or seven different countries about some of the initiatives that they are taking in social media. And one of the critical points, I think, that, that strikes me from this morning's conversation and yesterday, social media is not very expensive. Now, there's a lot of initiatives in many countries would like to take, but they cannot afford it. I don't understand that. But social media, I think one of the great advantages is that it is not an expensive proposition at all. And any country can do it. And you don't need very much. You don't need incredible resources. And one of the things that I hope will come out of this conference is that your nation will get some ideas about what you can do. And that's why when Dan Wade talked about the Facebook page and SOCOM put up there, that's just an initiative. It didn't cost anything except for, you know, the incidental costs. And, uh, you know, we look to other countries to engage this kind of new phenomenon, this new kind of idea which we call social media. And so if you take something away from this in terms of what your country can do, either in terms of developing your own Facebook page or what Dan said, I know that Admiral McRaven will be talking about it a little later, about how military organizations or other organizations can use social media to bring a better sense of cohesion and stability to its, uh, to its population and to what you're trying to do. So I think this, is, this will be interesting when we make here. There's a lot of other countries doing some interesting stuff too, but the capability is there. We've selected six or seven countries uh, to hear them talk a little bit about what they're doing in terms of social media. Mostly just to give you some ideas that you can take away from this. And as I say, it's not expensive. But nobody can say we cannot afford it. Uh, a lot of times countries say that for other kinds of initiatives and with considerable justification. But this is a kind of tool that nations can use, that embassies can use, that militaries can use, that organizations can use to promote your own interest at relatively small cost. So let me uh, introduce our panelists. We have, and you see their, their bios in there, we have somebody who Mario Altima, somebody from Russia, and uh, Mr. Chang from China. And uh, it's a good assortment. My Chinese is a little Latin. So I think let's listen to them and have a little conversation. We want to make this as informal as possible. We ask them each to do a short presentation. And then we'll open the discussion. And, there may be others who ought to be up here too, and a lot of your nations are doing it. I know a lot of your embassies have basic have, have websites, and we're trying, I look through them, and some of them are more sophisticated than others, but we want to go beyond that to engage with social media that's relevant to civilian populations, to embassies, to diplomats, and to military people. So let's uh, begin with. Uh, Let's start with the Great China. Okay, thank you. And, uh, okay, uh, uh, in the beginning, let me share a few words about myself. My name is Wen Xu Yang. I am uh, from uh, the uh, Chinese Embassy in Washington, D.C. I am actually the press officer. I joined the diplomatic service in the 1996. I, uh, after that, I was uh, hosted in Africa for a few years. And after that, I went back to work in the headquarters in the foreign ministry uh, responsible for media affairs and uh, the management for social media. And this is my second post to be in the United States. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to be here today to join you to exchange my views on the, my government's perspective on the, on the internalization of social media. 
And thanks for this wonderful conference and uh, these interesting presentations. I feel I'm really very honored. Uh, I'm honored to have this opportunity to share with you uh, China's perspective on the issue of social media. I know social media in China is an interesting and exciting topic to many of us. And uh, people are doing a lot of research on the operation and the development of social media in China. Uh, I see that on the website of this conference, uh, of this story change number nine, I read uh, some descriptions of uh, a few popular Chinese media in China, uh, the, the media websites, social media websites. Well, I think our hosts are doing a pretty good homework, much better than I. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, yes, nowadays, China is increasingly become a good point, I think, in many aspects. Uh, I think everybody who is Chinese and in Paris comes to many people. It has a long history and cultural traditions. It has a social system that different from many countries that you represent. Uh, it's a long development, it's a major. And the social development in many areas, including the rapid growth of social media, attracts very attention. Uh, yes, indeed, over the past years, China has made remarkable progress in social media as well as in many aspects. Uh, let me tell you, China was only linked to the internet in the year of 1994. Uh, since then, after 18 years today, the number of internet users of China has reached 530 million. Uh, this is the largest maximum population so far in the world. Now, Chinese citizens account for about 38% of the total population. I think that's higher than the world average. Uh, social media in China have also enjoyed rapid development over these years. The few social network sites listed on the website of this conference, like Xiuxiu, Renden, and Kaixi, Double Wen, uh, those are all major homegrown social media in China. Today, they have hundreds of millions of active users. On this, I think most people have no doubt. Well, uh, the issue that some people might doubt or sometimes misconceive, I think, is on China's attitude towards social media. I hear some people say Chinese government fears social media as does not want to see the development of social media. So Chinese government imposes substantial restrictions on some may say you cannot criticize the government on Chinese social media or you will be prosecuted. Uh, as I noted, some scholars often take China as a negative case when talking about government policies towards social media. Well, in my opinion, these views and claims are mostly misconceptions. They are not the real case in China, and we cannot agree. Uh, in fact, we are very much willing to exchange views in a casual and mutual respectful manner. This helps to enhance the mutual understanding on a wide range of issues, especially on those we disagree. And I think this is what this conference is significant for. Uh, then, uh, what is the real attitude and policy of the Chinese government towards social media? Uh, well, let me take a few words to briefly summarize to four points. Uh, first, uh, I think I can say that the Chinese government promotes rather than hinders the growth of social media. China encourages social media to play a role that's positive and progressive to social development. And China adopts the attitude and policy that promotes the healthy development of social media. On this policy environment, social media in China are developing in a quick and healthy way. A typical type of social media in China is microblogs. We call that microblog. A microblog combines features of Twitter and Facebook. It's more like a Twitter. That's why some people call it the, the Chinese version of Twitter. Microblogs made their first experiences in China in the year of 2007. Now, more than half of Chinese citizens are using 
microblogs. It is actually the most popular uh, uh, instrument of social media in China. Up to date, the number of microblog users in China exploded to a very high number of 330 million. It's the most influential microblogging site. The most influential microblogging site in China is called the Sign of Weibo. It attracts nearly 300 million users. Besides microblogs, other forms of social media also grow vigorously. For example, two largest platforms for social network sites in China, I think some people know that, Renren and Trashi Double One, which are mentioned on the website of this conference, both have a membership where about 100 million users. Right now, 50 largest social media platforms in China have a total of more than 200 million new postings every day, providing access to information. The Chinese people use social media freely and widely in their life. They use social media to do various things, such as exchanging information, expressing themselves, making friends, playing games, as well as criticizing the government and party complaints. Some reports say nowadays young people in China make more friends online than offline. Obviously, we couldn't see such a bus growth of these microphones or SNES platforms if the Chinese government adopts a strictly or unfriendly attitude towards the media. Well, that's my first point. Second, the Chinese government utilizes social media to improve public services. Recently, a migrant worker, this is the story of how my government is doing this. Recently, a migrant worker in China's Jiangsu province lodged a complaint on the microblog site, telling the local government that he had not received his wage for a few months. Local government Department of Labor intervened after the investigation and helped the worker get his wage back. This is one of the examples. The other one, in December 2010, a Chinese police department opened up a microblog account to help rescue the abducted children. This is welcomed by the Chinese public. Many people take photos of child beggars or homeless children they see on the streets and post these photos on this police microblog. These photos provide useful clues to the police and help rescue a big number of abducted children. Well, these are good examples of the Chinese government using social media to improve services. Nowadays in China, more and more government organs are using social media to better interact with people so as to better deliver government services. Today, various departments of the Chinese government at different levels have opened up a total of 50,000 microblog accounts. Chinese Foreign Ministry, well, my, uh, the, 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 the department where I'm from, opened up quite a few microblogs on major Chinese social media. These government microblogs are utilized to release public information, answer inquiries, service advice, and handle complaints. They are becoming new platforms for the Chinese government to serve its people. Third, the Chinese government welcomes public supervision from, su from social media. Currently, there is a catchphrase in China called to oversee government while microblogs. It means people can supervise the government by utilizing social media. The Chinese government supports this supervision and responds quickly to complaints made on social media. Over recent years, a great, number of case, uh, a great number of cases of problems reported through social media have been resolved by the government. By this, the government work is continuously improved. Last year, as some of you may know, quite a few road accidents involving school buses occurred in some rural areas in China. These accidents caused casualties on school children. The causes of these accidents include poor quality of school buses, overloading, reckless driving, etc. These incidents received huge attention on Chinese social media. People posted a large amount of reports, photos, comments on blogs, microblogs, 
social networking sites calling on the government to address the issue immediately. The government acted quickly. The central government conducted thorough investigations and to the number of actions to solve this problem. Regulations on school bus safety is revised. More fund is allocated to buy high quality school buses for rural area. Now the situation is greatly improved. In recent years, food safety scandals are exposed and discussed extensively on social media. The Chinese government has been very responsive and serious in handling these scandals. Great efforts and effective measures are taken to ensure food safety. In other recent cases in China of supervision, we also see a number of government officials get sacked or prosecuted as their corruption behaviors were exposed on Chinese social media. Fourth, the Chinese government administers social media based on law. The purposes for such administration and regulation are to create a market environment for fair competition, to guarantee all citizens' legitimate rights and interests, and to safeguard national security and public interests. The goal for social media administration is to ensure the sustainable and healthy development of social media in China. Well, in practice, the Chinese government exercises administration on social media in line with relevant laws and regulations. This actually performs to common international practice. For instance, like what is done in most countries regarding activities on social media, the Chinese government acts in accordance with laws and regulations to prohibit the spread of information that contains contents undermining national interests, inciting ethnic hatred, advocating heresy, pornography, violence, terror, and other information that violates the legitimate rights and interests of others. In addition to laws and regulations, administrative supervision, industry self-regulation, and public supervision also play important roles in China's social media administration system. We are working hard to explore a social media administration scheme that is suitable to Chinese conditions and consistent with international practices. While well, social media are still in a state of rapid expansion with new situations and new issues emerging constantly, China is waiting to enhance communications and exchanges with all countries and relevant parties on the issue of social media. China stands ready to join hands with the rest of the world to take new opportunities and new challenges brought about by the social media. Well, that's all of my presentation. I hope this will shed some light for you on China's attitude towards social media. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh,
subsidiaries is educational and others, uh, but the, the newspaper has. And so they say Google can uh, acquire uh, an asset that's losing money uh, just because uh, of the uh, legacy value. So I'm, I'm your legacy value guy. <laughs> And uh, for me, uh, what's, what's uh, my uh, most important point, to which I will come uh, back over and over again, is that the message, the content, is more important than the medium, the instrument, the platform through which that content is uh, distributed uh, to, to the audience. And uh, in that sense, <coughs> I uh, must uh, admit that <coughs> I uh, do not agree uh, at all with the uh, thesis uh, that we uh, so promoted here that uh, in this day and age it's important to be the first, not necessarily uh, to be the most accurate in what you report. My, my impression is, is exactly the opposite. Uh, I, I, my, my, my personal experience with the uh, social uh, media uh, an unpleasant one uh, when, when I like, was first made aware of, of this whole new deal uh, came in uh, 2008 when uh, President Obama, when he was candidate Obama, uh, was actively using the media uh, in his campaign and uh, it was known that he would announce his running way uh, through either email or uh, through a uh, social media source. Uh, everybody was expecting that uh, Governor King of uh, Virginia uh, was mentioned as a probable candidate. So when, uh, when I received communication from the Obama campaign uh, saying that the decision had been made uh, uh, and uh, Governor King was a choice, uh, I had a very difficult uh, choice to make. I could either file immediately because uh, I do agree with Mr. Hendon that. Uh, being first matters in my business and in the news business. Uh, I could try to hold off and verify the, uh, the uh, information. Uh, uh, and that is what I tried to do, and then I lost my nerve, so to speak, and I did fine. And it turned out to be a uh, fail. Uh, that taught me a lesson. Uh, I'm not saying I'm not using uh, the uh, social media as a source. I'm saying that I'm checking and rechecking and triple checking uh, everything that I learned from them. Because for me, uh, my only asset as a journalist, I believe this is my only asset, is uh, the relationship of trust uh, that I build uh, with my sources, who are real people, who, whom I have hundreds of. Uh, in my 15 years in Washington, D.C., and with my imaginary audience. If I find <coughs> repeatedly something that, that, that's not accurate, uh, I'm not even saying that I'll probably get fired by my voices, <laughs> but uh, I mean, what's, what's the point? Who, who, who believes me? Who, who needs this sort of information? So uh, this is one uh, major issue that I think the new media brings to my view, uh, to my perspective. Uh, the, uh, the other, uh, on, on a larger scale, I would say the issue of trust uh, involves uh, the uh, questions have, that have been raised in this room repeatedly by, uh, by people from uh, different embassies, from different nations, Again, the issue of trust uh, to the information uh, itself coming uh, from, from government sources uh, that people mistrust. Actually, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting proposition. Uh, simply about this. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Khalil, uh, who was describing uh, the uh, Arab Spring events for us, uh, she uh, basically uh, described that the, the people in the Arab world who are treating with mistrust and basically contempt uh, almost anything coming from official sources, including on the new media. Actually, maybe on the new media it makes uh, this information even more ridiculous in the eyes of the people. Right? So, uh, to me, aside from everything else, 
it meant that like the more legitimate source of information in that scenario almost by default automatically becomes an alien source, a critical source, an outside source. And we all know that in this day of age, in this information environment that we have, that source, more often than not, comes from the US and comes in the English language. Even like if we, if we think about it, even in terms of in the terms of the terminology, the uh, cloud computing, cloud sourcing, uh, all those uh, the computers themselves, the iPads and the iPhones and all of that, uh, the Facebooks and Twitters, these are all words that now exist in Russian. And I'm sure they exist in all the other languages in this room, and understandably without translation. That in itself shows how much influence, how much influence this country has on this uh, framing, even framing uh, the discussion of today and tomorrow in the new media. And obviously for us, for people like myself, the question is, how do we treat this? Uh, and I think that in my job, uh, for my audience, uh, one of the important aspects of my job is explaining, is uh, telling the people, uh, like I, 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 I regard that as my value added, because the facts are known, the facts belong to everyone. Uh, what I can do, being in Washington DC and, uh, and having been there for many years and knowing many of the key players, uh, personally, professionally, personally, in my professional capacity, what I can do is I can basically explain what, what they are saying between the lines, or what they are saying and why they are saying this. And uh, sometimes I myself uh, am uh, a little uh, worried and surprised by what I mean. Uh, a case in point, uh, the Americans recently uh, had uh, the new uh, Undersecretary of State for Public Diplomacy appointed, Tara Stolenstein, a wonderful lady. Uh, I've met her, she, she, she is great, she is very smart, uh, she has a great career both in uh, public service and uh, in private work. Uh, when she was uh, going through the transition period uh, in Congress, uh, she gave an outline of uh, how she regards this whole thing. She regards, and I'll quote because this is important, uh, this is what she says. She regards the uh, freedom of information, the freedom of law of information, this quote, a new human right 